Welcome everybody. We're very excited to have you here. We're happy that this topic was of such interest to you. Stevens College is an undergraduate all-female school in Columbia, Missouri, but we run an MFA program in TV and screenwriting where our students come for a 10 days in Hollywood at the Jim Henson Studios, and we get all kinds of lovely guest lecturers coming in, and then we always host something with the Guild. We're very happy to have all our mentors be members of the Writers Guild and working writers, and we're very happy that our mission is to bring more female voices and underrepresented voices into mainstream media. So this idea of transitioning was very important to us because a lot of people come from other careers and want to see how they're going to make this town work for them. So we're really excited to be joined by four very interesting ladies with great pasts and who are working on some really fun projects right now. So we thank them all for joining us. And because I know one of the biggest questions that always come to us before we get into the nitty gritty of how they made the changes is, of course, what's everyone's origin story? Because we're all superheroes in our own right. So I'm going to ask each uh, woman to please tell us that. And I'll begin uh, only because I'm so excited to say we're happy among our panelists is one of our alumni of our program. And that is Rashawn. And so Rashawn, if you would start with your origin story, that would be great. Thank you for having me, Roseanne. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Pardon me, good afternoon. I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, let's see. I uh, grew up in Atlanta, probably in a little city outside of Atlanta called Decatur. And um, when I was growing up, I always wanted to be in entertainment. And I was told by my parents to go and get a job with some benefits. And so I joined the military. And uh, after that, I went to work as a civilian for the federal government. Uh, as a physical security specialist. And so it, it was a big change for me, a leap for me to leave such a secure position and enter into such an um, undetermined uh, field such as entertainment. Um, I did it like right before I hit the mid-career point because I figured if I was gonna disappoint my family, I better do it at that point. <laughs> and plus if I stayed any longer, I might as well uh, retire. And so <laughs> that's what I did. And now I'm a writer here in Los Angeles, living in Atlanta and very thankful that I met Roseanne and entered the Stevens program, so thank you. And what show are you on right now? Oh, pardon me, I'm on SEAL Team on CBS. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Kalea, would you go for it? I'm sorry, hello everybody. I'm so excited to be here um, to talk to you about my, my transition to write for film and television. Um, I was born and raised on Long Island uh, in a small town. When, whenever I say I was, I'm from New York, people are like, ooh, Manhattan. And I'm like, no, I'm from a small shitty town. Um, oh, excuse me, I curse a lot. Um, <laughs> that I had to literally escape from. Um, I'm a first generation college student. And for those of you who are first gen, you probably know that that comes with a lot of accolades and you're so excited, but then you realize there's a lot of baggage and obligation that comes along with it as well. So upon graduating from NYU, which was very exciting on a full scholarship, I, I felt I had to do something to make my family proud, to make it all worth it. My grandmother, who was a chief at Rikers Island paid for me to go to private school, which was what led to all of these academic, all of this academic success. So I ended up on the PhD track to get a PhD in creative writing. Uh, one positive thing was I always knew I was a writer. The other thing was I knew I had an obligation to my family to put some initials behind before my name. Uh, so I ended up, um, I was a novelist at uh, night, but by day I was a college professor. I actually taught at Spelman College for five and a half years, another women's college down in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and there was a point though, where I kept feeling I want to go to Hollywood. I feel like I have something to contribute. Without giving away my age, I will say that having the dream of going to Hollywood to write for film and television sounded like you wanna just go into space to work with aliens. You knew television existed, but you kind of didn't realize that people were writing those stories. And you also knew instinctively that they were not black and very much so even more instinctively that they were not black women. Uh, so even some of those shows that I loved growing up when I look back at the credits, I'm like, that was a room full of white men. That's very interesting. Um, so it just sounded like writing for film and television just wasn't going to happen for me. At night, I would go to coffee shops 
and I started writing scripts. And I wrote my way out of being a college professor. That's what I tell people all the time. I never had an intention like saying, I'm going to send this script to Spike Lee and he's going to give me a job. It was just, I'm going to write the perfect script. And one day, someone's going to ask to read it and they're going to read it and it's going to blow their socks off. And that's literally what happened. So I think that's my origin story. Oh, right now I am working at my dream job in the Walking Dead universe as an executive story editor on Fear the Walking Dead. Well, that's so wonderful. Thank you and congratulations as well. That's so exciting. All right, Zoanne. Kalea, is that how you say it? Aren't you mad that um, Lin-Manuel Miranda took your write your way out thing? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> I want my check. Yeah, yeah. I think we should talk to him about that. Um, hey, I'm Zoan Clack. I um, I basically started being cultivated to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> I grew up outside of Houston, and my to a single. I'm the only child of a single mom, and you know, basically, success was being a doctor or a lawyer in in my subset of people. And so I know I didn't want to be a lawyer. So I was, I was on the doctor track. I used to get like um, chemistry sets and microscopes and stuff for, for Christmas. Like I was tailored to do that. And then um, in high school, I was like, wait, how long does that take? And it's a long time. And um, <laughs> I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I want to do something else. I don't know. So I went to Northwestern and I kind of just took my freshman year to kind of find myself and figure out what I wanted to do. But I, I you know, I was, as a, as the only child of a single mom who worked two jobs, she was a teacher. Um, I did a lot of television watching. Um, I was kind of raised secondarily by the television and I loved television. So I was like, well, maybe I can do some entertainment thing. Not knowing of course that Northwestern has a fantastic radio TV film program that people really, really, really try to get into. Um, so it took me like a year to like do a bunch of extracurricular things and get into their program. And I was super excited about it. And then that summer I came home and my mom was like, oh, that's great. Like she didn't tell me no, but I knew what was on what was going on there. So I went back and I changed my major, major to communications because it did take a long time just to get to the school of communications. So I, I stayed in communications and then did, did like, you know, a minor in neurobiology like you do. And then I spent the next like 10 years doing medicine. I went to UT Southwestern Med School. I did my um, residency at Emory in emergency medicine. And I basically started burning out pretty quickly deciding what am I going to do next? And I thought maybe I'd do another residency or, you know, try to stay in medicine, do some research. I actually did a fellowship and got my master's in public health, did some international emergency medicine, um, and then just kind of wasn't finding my niche. And I was like, you know what? I always really wanted to do this entertainment thing. And I have a pretty good day job. Um, and I have some friends in LA. So I started kind of going back and forth with my friends. And um, I was, you know, I'm, I'm never one to be like a starving artist kind of thing. So. I had a lot of things set up in LA, like an apartment and jobs and, and all this stuff. And I had friends looking for jobs for me. And one of my friends was looking at the back of an, an ER uh, magazine, like one of the one of our professional magazines. And the show ER was looking for an on-set person. And you know, I had done my radio TV film in college. So I was like, ooh, let me apply for this. This would be awesome. So I sent off a letter, heard nothing. And then I was random, I, I was never one to like actually mention that I wanted to do entertainment, which seemed fluffy and wild in comparison to like saving lives on this side. So for some reason, I mentioned it to one of my mentors at Emory and in Atlanta. And he was like, oh yeah, I trained with that guy. You should just mention my name. So I wrote another letter with his name in it, got an interview came up to LA and was like the most excited I'd ever been about a job interview. And I should also mention that the show ER started at the same time that I started my ER residency. So I kind of grew up with the show and, you know, I was seeing all the sets and everything. It was giddy, didn't get the job, but I still decided I was going to move to LA and do my thing. And I, like, like Clay was saying, I grew up thinking, you know, these 
these shows just wrote themselves or something. Like all I saw was the box and the actors on it. So I, I thought I wanted to be an actor and I took a bunch of acting classes. And what had happened was I, um, <laughs> I realized that actors don't just put drops in their eyes to cry. Like they have to like emote and bring it from like the depths of their horrid origins and things. So like, as we were doing that, you know, on the one side, my doctor side was like, push it all down, push it all down and move on. And on the other side, the acting part was like, bring it up and pull it out. So I was bringing all this stuff out and didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, so I started writing and then I remembered oh my God, when I was like 11, I wanted to be like the youngest author and, <laughs> and somebody published something. So I just left that alone. Um, that was younger than me. Uh, so I was like, I wanna do this writing thing. So I took, I, I was taking classes at UCLA Extension and um, then started taking a writing class and off of my writing class, you know, when I interviewed for ER and they didn't hire me, they were like, we'll keep you in mind. And I thought that was really Hollywood of them and cute. Um, but then like a year later, one of the executive producers was doing a new show, which was medicine, and they weren't sure if they'd need anyone, but he was like, why don't you interview this lady? We really liked her. So I literally had written one script and went in for the, for my interview. And I was like, you know, I'll do whatever you want. I'll be on set. I'll be a consultant, but I'd really love to write. And I shoved that script into her face. <laughs> and two months later, she made me a staff writer. And that was my first job. It lasted eight months. And then my second job was Grey's Anatomy and I've been here for 17 seasons. <laughs> That's the dream, 17 seasons on a show. How wonderful, congratulations. <laughs> That's so hey, gorgeous. I've given them my youth, for real. No joke. <laughs> oh, that, that's wonderful. All right, Akila, what's your origin story? Hi, everyone. I'm Akila Green. Thank you for having me. What great company to be in. Uh, it's interesting. It seems like there are themes and patterns that are similar among all of our origin stories. Um, I'm also from outside of Houston, an only child who grew up in front of the TV, uh, a latchkey kid where it was when it was okay to drop your child off in front of a TV for 12 hours unattended. <laughs> and I grew up with a love for TV. My parents both have graduate degrees. And so there was always an expectation that not only would I go to college, but I would also go get this second degree. And as Zoanne said, it would be a doctor, lawyer, business person, whatever that could be, engineer. And so I knew that I wanted to do something in TV and like these other women have said, wasn't quite sure what that job was, wasn't quite sure how I, I didn't know anything about Hollywood. I did have lawyers in my family. And my father is a political junkie and he passed that down to me. And my cousins lived in DC. And so somewhere along the way, I decided I would be a lobbyist. Somebody, one of my closest friends in high school knew what a lobbyist was and was like, you should do that. We were in the food court of Willowbrook Mall. And so I, <laughs> so I went to the university, that was my senior year in high school. Um, I went to the University of Texas at Austin and they had a great radio television film program that was like just really getting a lot of buzz because Robert Rodriguez had just graduated from there. And I was like, I'm gonna major in radio, television and film. And my dad said, with whose money? And so, and so I too did communications, which was like, I could get close to it, but I could also do like corporate communication PR. So I graduated, there was no support for me going to Hollywood to be a TV writer. And I don't think it, I knew that TV writing was what exactly what it was that I wanted to do. So I went to law school at the University of Michigan with the goal of graduating and becoming a lobbyist in DC at a big shiny law firm. And I knew when I graduated that I was only going to be in DC. I gave my, I'm, I, won't, I also won't reveal my age, but I gave myself an age cap. Once you get to this age, you have to leave and you're gonna go to LA and start over. And it was kind of the, I, like checking that box for my parents and my family. Um, and so that's what I did. And I worked at a fancy law firm. I had a really great time in DC in my twenties, making a lot of money, partying, being a lobbyist is fun. Um, it was a great time to be in DC. I'll leave that there. Um, <laughs> and so, and then I, but while I was there, I started it's a, I'll say at some point, along, I'm a comedy writer. At some point along the way, I realized I was funny. I started doing stand-up, started taking sketch comedy classes, started taking improv classes. 
and trying to write scripts. And I remember I took an online course from Media Bistro, which I don't think exists anymore, but it, but it taught me how to write scripts because I did not go to school for that. And truly it, I learned the most that I've learned like by formal education from that small online course that I took. Um, and then I hit the age that I was talking about and I was eligible for partner and they were starting to groom me for partner at my firm which is like when the partners start taking you to lunch and the, I, some partners would like have a bi-weekly meeting with me to kind of like, what are your concerns? What can we do? And I was like, I have to go. I had been at that firm for about seven years. And I was like, if, I, if they make me partner, like they're gonna throw money at me. And next thing you know, I live in, the, in Maryland or Virginia and this is what I do for the next 30 years. So I flew out to LA like on a Thursday afternoon and I was like, I'm, I can't give notice until I have like, I've signed a lease in LA. Like I needed some foot on the ground in LA. So I found an apartment that weekend, signed a lease and came back and gave notice. Um, and so that was about seven years ago. I just packed up and left uh, DC and moved to LA. Um, and and uh, I, I, I bet we're gonna get into the how you maneuver that type of stuff later, but long story short, I use a lot of networking, a lot of like coffees, lunches, follow up, who, you know, putting my name in a lot of people's uh, mouths and on their minds and got my first break uh, maybe three years after being here. And so I currently write for HBO's A Black Lady Sketch Show, show and Showtime's Black Monday. <laughs> um, and I have a show in development at, at ABC. That's wonderful. Thank you. And again, congratulations to everybody for making this huge choice and of course making it work. That's the goal. Um, let's go backwards and we'll go around the same way because you walked into my next question, which is what kind of preparation did you do? We've heard taking some classes. What else did you do to get yourself into the position where people would take you seriously? Because many people are told, come to LA and become a writer's assistant, but it's generally a job for someone right out of college. So you don't walk into that when you're a little bit older. So what were the things you did to prepare you to move into this business? Sure, like I said, I, mean, I knew I wanted to be a comedy writer. When I figured out that writing was the thing that I wanted to do, comedy writing became very clear to me. So I started doing stand-up because I knew that a lot of stand-ups that were able to transition. When, people, when, when rooms are looking for funny people, they will look to stand-up comedians and improv performers. And so I started doing that and I started writing sketches. And then, like I said, you, got, you have to get these scripts. <laughs> uh, you can't, you can want to write, but they want to see some samples. And so I started writing scripts. And, and I don't know if this is still in answering your question, but when I got out here, I did not know anybody, but I had friends of friends who were in the industry. So so-and-so I met at such and such's wedding is out here and is sometimes run shows. And so I was like, let's have coffee. So I tapped a lot of those wires. It was a lot of networking, which I think is like seen as an ugly, or dirty ward, dirty ward, and like writers in particular, sometimes like to lean into this stereotype of like I'm antisocial and it's cool and I'm awkward and it's like that's great, but you also have to get people to want to hire you. So they have to know who you are and they have to like you. And so unless you want to write the great American novel by yourself in a cabin, you're going to have to figure out how to get into a writer's room, and that requires networking. And that's what I did a lot of. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can we go around, so Andy? You have some other thoughts about what you did to prepare? That's a big change, right? You're muted. Um, what I did to prepare, I, <clears throat> well, before I left Atlanta, I did take, well, cause I thought I wanted to act. So I took, the, took an acting course just to like, make sure that I wouldn't be completely, um, like just hate it. <laughs> so I, I took an acting course and it was actually, I thought it was kind of fun. So, and like I said, I had like people here looking for jobs for me and I would make trips here. Um, you know, I had I had a lot of friends that I was visiting. Um, so I would set up jobs and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, it's funny because oddly, I keep a lot of my old calendars and stuff and I look through those and the amount of stuff that I did when I got here was I, I don't even understand how I did that stuff. I did UCLA Extension. I did a couple of other acting classes. I did work acting workshops. Um, I was I wasn't writing yet, 
but like I was doing night shifts mostly so I could like have time to like audition and do things during the day. I actually got an agent and did a couple of little co-star roles um, while I was doing it. Um, you know, a little small boutique thing. And then I discovered writing and then I started taking that UCLA extension class and started doing that. And then after I got my break and got that first job, we were only on for eight months and we, we got canceled like right before staffing season. And what I didn't say is that the, I thought I wanted to do comedy because I always watched comedy on TV. So I had written a Sex in the City script, which thankfully was the same um, format and not, you know, the, the three camera format um, as drama. So I had written a Sex in the City and that's all I had as a sample, but now I was doing this drama. So I took, and back in the day, we were doing mostly specs. Um, so while I, during that eight months, I specced a um, CSI, you know, staying with my science. And then, you know, since it was the middle of staffing season, like I didn't get a job like right away. So I took the other, the next season to write a play and a couple of new, new specs and take a bunch of like writing classes so that I had, you know, people that knew stuff around me. And then I got the Gray's offer. But I mean, if you can, I would knock completely the assistant route. I mean, when I got in, uh, when I got my first job, I had literally only been here a year. I knew zero zilch, nothing. And I think it took me a long time, longer than it would have. And, and that's just me. I mean, I, you know, you're taking these classes and doing this stuff and you're way ahead of, the, way more ahead of the game than I am, than I was. But it took me a while to know what I didn't know and to learn what I didn't know I needed to learn. Um, so like the first, I would say even three to five years of me being staffed were not as growth heavy as they could have been. And when I see these assistants who are, um, you know, learning all the stuff and they, they, as soon as they get staffed, they're on it, they know what they're doing, they're, they're in it. Um, I mean, and, and they, they know people, they get to know people, they get to know uh, them intimately, they get to get the help um, and ask the stupid questions because they're not on staff and you're not expected to know a certain amount of things. So, I mean, it's a super hard that we're professionals and to go back to that, but if you have the capacity, if you have done your savings and, and all that, it's not a bad place. I would not forego it completely um, if you have that opportunity. Can I chime in? Can we go for it? Yeah, please, please. Just, yeah. I also just wanted to agree with Zoanne. Just, uh, we kind of glossed over the origin story, but I definitely started off as a writer's assistant. It was for a very small, short show, but like definitely had a law degree, left my firm at almost upper partner and started over as a writer's assistant. And then I, my first job was on Chelsea Handler's uh, Netflix show. And I started in the research department and did that eight, for eight months before I got moved up. So just saying, I just wanted to add that it's, I, I also am not knocking that route. Oh yeah. I'm sure no one, I mean, no one's knocking that route. We just don't think at a certain age, people want to do that. And you hit on something very important. I had been a high school teacher for only two years. So going back and answering phones didn't seem like a terrible step back, but there were days when I thought, what have I given up? I used to be in charge of like a bunch of children and now I'm like getting someone's coffee. So it is a, a choice. Well, now you are still in charge of a bunch of children. <laughs> they were just older. That is true. Kalea, Sometimes you'll find that starting over is the fastest path to getting where you want to go. That's a quote people should write down. <laughs> um, I, I'll say for me, I think I, I was, I, my first jobs were at, out of NYU, were at Simon & Schuster and Henry Holt and Company. I thought I wanted to be an editor, a book editor. So my life looked a lot like Devil's Wears, The Devil Wears Prada. And I was not, going to be someone's assistant ever again. Um, I do find value in that period because you learn a lot about the industry. You get to watch writers, you get to watch how uh, people network, how people negotiate and move about in that professional space, which is very valuable. Um, but, you know, alas, I was way too old 
<laughs> when I came here to be an assistant, not, not too old, that is not a good thing to say. Um, but I was at a, a point in my career that it, it just didn't feel like it was really the move for me to make. Um, I, I wanted to start with my transition by saying my transition is a little different from, from some other people in that uh, my bachelor's degree, my master's degree and my PhD are all in English, um, all with a focus in creative writing, all with a focus in fiction. So I was always trying to hide and say, I just want to be an editor. Uh, so that was the English route. But really, you know, I was creeping in the creative writing programs at every school I went to. Um, so I've always had a connection to story, always been very interested in story and the protagonist narrative and the hero's journey. Um, so I didn't have to learn a lot about story, but there's a big difference which a lot of people don't realize. And you can see that shift when they're moving from short story writing or novel writing to screenwriting and the, the, the technical nature of script writing. So my current manager, who is a person who moved me from Atlanta, who got me the job that I moved from Atlanta to Los Angeles, read a script that I wrote. He, he read that script in 2017. And then I started coming here to interview. At one point I looked at my laptop and realized I started writing that script in 2012. So 30 minute comedy. <laughs> I started writing it in 2012 and it changed over the years, so many different iterations, me pulling characters out, putting scenes in, and that's because I wanted that work to be perfect. I knew that when someone read that script, I wouldn't be there. If, you, if anyone knows anything about book publishing, you're familiar with what's called the slush pile, which are submissions people send in. Uh, often you open it, you get to the first page and there's a period out of place. So just something that makes you angry because you don't wanna read this and you just throw it away. And I was like, my script has to be perfect. From page one, I have to have this person laughing and also thinking, I think Akila kind of brought this up, who is this girl? Who wrote this script? I have to meet the person who wrote this. Um, so I, I want to point out that it took that long to perfect the script because that was going to be my buy-in in Hollywood. We call it a calling card to get where I wanted to be. Um, I then, I think after like two years, this is all an email, it's all documented. In two years, I had a friend who was a producer and I was like, hey girl, um, I know you just had a baby and you just sitting at home and everything. Can you read my script? <laughs> So she read the script and she was like, hey, she has nothing to do. She's home. She was like, why don't you come over? Let's talk about it. That turned into a mini workshop for my script. Then she had another friend who is a director and she said, you should read this script. She came over and she said, let's start working on this script together. So then it was the three of us working on my script. And then another person read the script and passed it to her husband, um, Seath Mann, who's a, a Hollywood director who I didn't even know who this man was. I'm just be honest with you. They were like, we're sending it to this woman's husband. And I was like, sure, I don't care. And he was like, I'm sending it to my manager. Again, I, I just wanna really say, which I think is important for art. I didn't necessarily have the intention of coming to Hollywood, getting a job, making it big, becoming rich. I just wanted the perfect script. So the idea of Seath Man getting the script, sending it to his Hollywood manager, me meeting an agent, you know, coming to Hollywood and smooching with all these people, I just wanted the work to be good. Um, and I really think that that was what opened the doors, that I was more focused on the work and less focused on this dream of being a big time um, Hollywood writer. So I think I answered the question. You did, because we talk a lot about having that calling card be as perfect as it can be, because that slush pile is very real. And everyone who's reading them wants their own script to be read. So they love to have an excuse not to look. And if you have a spelling error or whatever it is, they love to dismiss you. That's beautiful. Um, all right, so Rashawn, how did you prepare to make this change? Okay, um, what I did was I uh, apply to UCLA Extension the Producers Program because I'd grown up watching CBS dramas at my grandparents' feet, not really knowing or comprehending what I was uh, watching with them, but um, loving the fact that I was liking story and my grandfather and my grandmother were so interested in their stories <laughs> and all of that, you know. So I, I, I 
I was really interested in when I started out and okay, how is this made? How, how, how is this special sauce made? So I left my job with two children on my hip um, and came to Hollywood and promptly failed. And that's a hard thing to say because, I mean, I'm looking at three other women and we've got a PhD, an MD, a JD, and two MFAs over here. And it's not an easy thing to say you failed. Like literally I failed and I had to um, make some decisions about what I was going to do after I went through uh, two uh, retirement funds with two children and being paranoid as to whether or not I would be able to take care of them and what would happen. And so I think the biggest thing for me was after I had done all of that and I had little jobs here and there in Hollywood and thinking, okay, now I'm gonna have my foot in the door um, and still nothing happening in the, in the fashion of which I needed it to happen because I was, as I said, I, I mean, I'm not gonna say I was making it, you know, uh, answering to my family because I was a grown behind woman and I had made a decision to leave my very secure job with my children. But at the same time, when your mother, who's a professional and RN and you come from an educated family, um, they're looking at you going, what the hell did you do? You feel like you got to come up with something to say. <laughs> and I had nothing to say other than I know I'm supposed to be here. The saving grace for me literally was that um, I had gone to the DGA for something and someone had told me about the uh, WGA Veterans uh, Retreat Writing Program. And uh, they told me on a Friday, they told me on a Saturday and the application had closed that Friday night. And so I had to wait a whole year, but in that year, I was doing things. I, I, I've never been just, you know, the type to sit around. So I was always like watching movies over and over. Like, what is this? What's so great about this? Why did it win Best Picture? Why, you know, why is this, you know, the international film of the year that everybody's talking about? And so that's what I did. I kept reading books and and going over to, um, um, you know, get, getting stuff from Amazon, just reading, reading, and reading, and writing, and writing, and writing the best way I could. And then I got into the program the next year. And that was the saving grace because um, Ken Lizabin had, had started a program that really, honest to goodness, it had been a weekend before, but I came in when it had gone from a weekend to a year. And he had a clear, clear curriculum as to how to teach these vets, these military vets, the, the not only the basics, but the quickest way to get from point A to point B, because most of us were not going to USC or UCLA or what have you to find out all of this information. And so I read, I'm, I met really great television writers because I was always enthralled with television growing up. Like literally my mother called me TV thing. I would sneak and watch all manner of television back like when they had miniseries and like you would skip a day and you would never see that miniseries again on TV until like three years later was in, and when it was in syndication and I would lose my damn mind. <laughs> it was just like the worst thing for me to have to skip an episode. And so I was always crazy about television. And so when I got into that program, they taught you about television, but I was still in a space where I wasn't feeling like I was getting the amount of success that I needed in order to justify me keep going to for me to keep going in that you know in Hollywood. And so um, I made a decision to go back and get um, an MF, another MFA, well another uh, master's degree. And in doing so, I got into the program. It opened up a, a world of knowledge for me. But the other thing that it did was that it allowed me to be able to then move into um, internship territory. And so I got internships, multiple internships at, at, at HBO, TNT. I mean, and so that allowed me to a network meet people, people who could um, vouch for me, talk to me. I wrote a spec script for um, Animal Kingdom and I was over at TNT and I took that spec script right on over there to the executive and I was like, girl, read this for me. You know, give me some pointers. And she was like really great. She sat down with me. Hey, Mar. 
she sat down with me and she was just like so kind. And there were so many kind executives who really helped me. When I say they helped me, they were really interested in helping a, a veteran. And that meant something to me because a lot of times people look at you when you're a veteran and they have a, they have a, a, a thought process about you before you ever come into the room. And so these people had open hearts and open minds and like all of these executives, like they, they vouched for me, they talked to me, they introduced me to additional people. And so I eventually, after um, working on multiple um, pilots and spec scripts, I was accepted into my, one of my pilots um, was accepted into the PGA program, the PGA, um, yeah, uh, 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 development program, and I was accepted into the CBS writing mentorship program. And that's how I ended up on SEAL team. And so that was very important because what I did was in, in writing that pilot, that, that the same pilot was accepted into the PGA program that got me into um, the CBS program. I wrote what I knew. I had a government background. And Years before I had sat around a table with um, a number of women who worked specific jobs for the federal government. And those jobs acquired top secret clearances. And they had families like me. I was a single mom. They had families like me and they worked at a, 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 and did things that the American public would totally be surprised that women were running things like this. And because you always see the men, you never see the women in those spaces. And so, and you always see them on television, you always see them in film, but you never see a Jane Bond. You always see a James Bond. And so when I had the opportunity, I sat down and I wrote a, a pilot that I felt like honored those women that I previously worked with, but also honored me and took a little bit out of my life and the things that I had done. And in doing that and staying honest to that, um, that became my calling card. And I'm very happy that I decided to just write about those women and write about myself and write about that job because, or an aspect of that job because um, when people read that pilot, it, because it's gotten me a lot of meetings, when people read that pilot, they wanna know like, oh my gosh, like this is a world that we have never seen before, but then they wanna talk about like, like this character's got kids. How does she work in this space? You know, and I was that person who had kids working in a certain space. And so that's how I got here. Yay. Oh my gosh. Those good stories. Okay. So here's my next question. What skills from your previous career have helped you in this career? What are the skills that you're glad you cultivated? Because in fact, you haven't thrown them away. They are still in fact useful in this new world. Whoever thinks they can go first. Diplomacy. Oh. <laughs> The understanding bureaucracy, diplomacy, and how to maneuver with people. I had done quite a number of jobs for the federal government, and one of my jo um, job duties was that I had negotiated with um, the union on a national level for the specific agency that I was working with on security issues. And it's something, to, and, and it's it's funny to hear that issue come up today at the U.S. Capitol. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's the same thing I was negotiating those um, years back, but. But to have to sit down and tell somebody, okay, um, you're going to have to have this amount of magnetometers and people say, no, we don't want magnetometers in the building and all these other things and people got to be wanted. It was a huge negotiation, like, like massive. And um, I was a young person doing that job. And um, I did that job by volunteering. Like none of the older people who had been at the agency longer than me wanted to, to had wanted to take that responsibility. But I was either I was either too smart for my own good or you know too dumb to know what I was doing because I was like, yeah, of course I'll negotiate with the union. <laughs> like who does that? <laughs> who raises their hand to do that? 
<laughs> and diplomacy is so necessary in this business. Yeah. That's such a good skill. I yeah. Know. And that's, Who else? And that's what I had to do. I had to sit there and I had to, I had to accept no. And I had to know when to push, when to draw back, when to say, no, you cannot have this. This is something that's definite. We cannot talk about this in any other way. We have to do this. Mm -hmm. And I had to understand that I was moving in a space after we had had a huge domestic violence incident in Oklahoma. And in doing that, um, people still had hurt feelings and I had to recognize that, but, and, and hear them when they talk to me and say that. And I think that that's a huge thing because you have to hear people. And if you don't hear people, then it becomes a, it becomes an issue. And so that's why I said diplomacy, understanding bureaucracy and how to maneuver in that space with people so that you both leave the table feeling like you got something. Perfect. Who's next? I wanted to add, and this goes off something uh, Keila said earlier about being a, you know, I'm just a weird writer, introvert, you know. I, I grew up with my nose in books. I, I was the girl, like, I don't, I'm again giving away my age, where they would give you this sheet that you, you know, like third grade, this sheet that you could take home and mark off all the books you wanted. I wanted all the books, <laughs> all the time, um, which meant that I was kind of pushing out the, the world around me. Uh, and so I didn't really talk a lot. I talked to my family and my siblings, um, but mostly I was shy. Uh, but there was a point in my life where I realized, there's a saying, closed mouths don't get fed, um, that I realized that wasn't working for me. <laughs> like This was not working. And if I wanted something, I had to put on, I think Beyonce calls it Sasha Fierce. I had to put on another skin so that people could get in and realize, hey, this, this girl is pretty, I'm patting my shoulder. This girl is pretty cool. You know, she's a misbehaving, I like to get into trouble kind of girl. I want to hang out with her. So one thing I got from uh, my, my work as a novelist, as an editorial assistant, and as a college professor is fearlessness. Um, I'm not afraid to walk into a room and talk to people, which means I am not afraid to pitch. If you're in a writer's room and you have an, first of all, writer's room, it's like 10 people, could be many more people, sometimes as, as few as six people. Everybody's coming in there with ideas. Writers are divas, sorry to tell it. Everybody thinks their idea is gonna be great. So you have to be able to present the best idea that's gonna get the showrunner's attention. And if, if nothing, if it doesn't land on the board, it at least gets people talking. That requires a certain amount of fearlessness. And then the next thing, tough skin. Because sometimes you present, I'll, I'll work on a pitch all night with my little notebook, like, yeah, and I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna break it down. <laughs> and then you present it and the showrunner's like, when's lunch? You know, so sometimes um, your ideas are shot down and you have to have a, a thick skin and know that it's going to be okay. The last skill that I took from all of my other careers that has worked for me in this career is um, editing and someone in the room, Alexis asked about um, errors and, you know, just small things you might find in scripts. Um, my, my editorial background, having this ability to read scripts uh, and do line editing sometimes and go to the showrunner and be like, hey, you know, maybe we could switch these things around, these little technical things. Sometimes if I had nothing to say in the room all day, that one thing gave me an opportunity to get some face time with the showrunner to talk about different things. And then, especially at my first job on Daybreak, to be dependent upon, like people were handing me scripts like, hey, can you read my script, you know? Um, so that was, that is a really good, uh, those are some skills that I've taken from all of my different careers that I still use today. And networking, again, as Akila said, you've got to open your mouth and talk to people. One thing I love about Hollywood, specifically writers in Hollywood, is they really want to know who you are. They're going to spend so much time with you every single day, away from their family, away from their friends. They want to know that if I sit down with you in a room, we're going to have a good time, not a good time, <laughs> We're gonna have a, we're gonna have some laughs at, at four o'clock when we can't break a story. Who's gonna make us laugh in the room? Who's gonna stick in there and give a pitch and just say something? Um, I, I really feel like people, specifically in these meetings, really want a sense of who you are inside. So you have to be comfortable networking and talking to different people. That's so true. Oh my gosh, brilliant, brilliant. Who's next? Oh, okay. Um, 
A couple of things. So my background is as a lawyer. And one of the things they teach you in law school, they train you how to think is what they say. And so basically you learn how to issue spot is what it's called. So like you take a large amount of information and you synthesize it very quickly and you point out the hole so that you were prepared for what opposing counsel is going to say. So that is a thing that I was trained to do. So I apply that when I read scripts where like, I have a great sense of the big picture, but details I'm on them. And so I can tell you, especially in comedy, sometimes people want to lead with the comedy, but it's funny. And it's like, well, yes, but you put that joke there. It's going to pull the string out of what we're trying to do in act two and ruin the setup on page 14. And like, that is a thing that law school has, and being a lawyer, and it was like what I was paid to do as a lawyer. Um, that's helped me. That's been very helpful. Um, and, and lawyers write a bunch and we have to be detail oriented. But, and then the lobbying part is where I kind of got very comfortable with network, networking because your entire job is to establish and maintain relationships. And so I know how to work a room. I got an elevator pitch down and knowing how to talk to people, sell yourself, uh, endear people to you as part of how people, like, like Kalea said, you're sitting in a room with people for many, many hours a day and telling stories and trying to contribute. And you, people wanna know that you're a pleasant person to be around. And then, like I said, networking is how you get through the door. You can have a great script, but if nobody knows who you are, it doesn't matter. And then I will say working at a corporate law firm, it taught me a level of professionalism that I think I would not have had had I come out here at 18, where like knowing how to return emails and follow up on things and send thank you letters and be on time and understand that time is money and that people expect deliverables. I, I see people struggling with those things, people who are talented writers, but don't understand that this is a business. Um, and so that is that is something I'm grateful that I, I came out here when I did because I would not have had those skills earlier. Thank you, that's brilliant. And people forget the whole job of producing, which we'll get into later exactly, has to do with all of those things. Zoanne? Well, I mean, my, my skill set is, uh, kind of obvious as I'm a doctor and I work on a doctor show. I use it all the time. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it was both, uh, it was both, you know, an impetus and a hindrance for me because it was an impetus, impetus in that it got me a job within a year of landing in Hollywood. Um, it was a hindrance because I, I used it as a crutch almost because I had that, because I knew that I kind of, folded myself into doing the medicine and didn't, and I, I've said this before, like I didn't go out and learn all the other stuff that I now know I needed to know. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was, I was, I was developing that skill, which is fine. I mean, it, it took me a while to like really, really develop that, that part of my skill. And then on Grey's Anatomy, you know, it's actually a large part it was a large part of my job and I didn't really have time or actually make the time to um, go to the editing bay after work or, you know, go talk to um, some of the writers about what their path, path was or, you know, sit down and write, if, if there was an outline, like write the scenes as I would write them and then have someone take a look at them afterwards. Like these are all things that I could have cultivated and, and done more, but I was so kind of focused on my piece of the show that it took me a while before I kind of sprouted out of that. And because I was the only one who did it for like the first 10 years of the show, the first 10 seasons. And now I've gotten the whole team around me and I do a lot less. And, and you know, there was a, a long period of time where I was like, oh, I'm just no good in the room. And it was because I was not in the room. <laughs> Like I was always doing my piece of it, putting the medicine in, figuring out the stories, um, figuring out how the personal worked with the with the medicine. And now that I'm in the room a lot more, I'm freaking great at the room. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because in my very first job, my um my my boss had a, a woman boss had a lot of confidence and faith in me. And she always said I was great in the room, but I didn't understand what she meant. Like, I was like, no, I'm not. Like, I'll put something out there and I don't have a story for it. But, you know, the, the fact that you put something out there and it's kind of, again, you, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, you know, now revisiting that, I was like, I see what she saw now. 
and it just took me a while to get there. So um, I say all that, but I would say definitely, definitely, definitely use what you got to get where you need to go. Because I think all of us have used what we, um, what we started off as to get into our next, you know, like Rashawn was saying, she wrote about what she knew, you know, like that, that first spec I wrote was a CSI because I know science. Um, and, you know, now I'm a single mom myself and I'm writing about like single mom relationships and parenting and, and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, you, as you grow and we have that perspective since we have had, you know, previous careers and stuff, we have such a worldly perspective that, you know, those people coming out of college do not have. And we can infuse that in our scripts. We can infuse that in, in the room. We can infuse that in our meetings and, you know, come across when they have questions about, or like my favorite meetings as, as, as a upstart writer were when I would go to the meeting and they wouldn't know I was a doctor. Like they just literally brought me in because they liked my script. And then if they didn't know I was a doctor, well, even if they did, but I knew I had like an hour and a half of, of talking to do because it was all about how did you break in? What was, the, what, how did you do this? So you have such vast experience that you can play on. And I, I see a lot of questions about ageism and, and things and ageism, ageism is real in, in um, Hollywood, but also people are learning that we have a lot to offer. You know, we have all of this experience and life stories and we've traveled the world and we have all of that, um, that I think that Hollywood is starting to appreciate more, I, I would like to say. Um, it's still hard. It's not, there's no panacea. There's no like vaccine, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> which is also not a panacea, um, but they're, um, we have a lot to offer and as long as you know your worth, I feel like that is gonna be a stepping stone to you getting to the next place. That's a beautiful sentiment, thank you. And thank you for addressing that. We'll get to, uh, we'll get, we'll try to get as many of those questions as we can. Uh, but my next question, I think people are very interested in, of course, story. And so my thought is, what is a story that you've taken from your past career or a character, the kind of person you knew in that past career that you found a place to put into the current thing that you're working on, the current show or perhaps your past show? What's well, a story that you're like, oh, that was so perfect. I'm gonna put that into this piece that I'm working on. Um, it's funny that you should say that because right now the show I'm working on, um, we're kind of addressing that with one of the characters that we have. And um, the thing about me is that I, I got married and um, had children very young, like, um, like stupid young and like, I was stupid. And so, <laughs> and so um, when, I, when I started to work for the federal government, I was um, divorced because I got married at a time when I didn't really know what I was doing. And so I was a single mother and I had to travel for upwards of 50% of my job. And I absolutely love my job. But one day I was um, leaving packing to go again to do some great work for the federal government. And my daughter came to me and she said, do they make you go or do you want to go? And um, I didn't know until like, a couple of years ago, how kind of, I mean, I knew I was feeling guilty, but I didn't know where I was gonna write and put that that guilt along the way, because as a single mom, you always have a lot of guilt when you, when you have to be away from your kids. But our character, my showrunner has graciously um, allowed me to be able to express that through um, one of our characters. And I'm very thankful for that because um, maybe, I can now move in a space where I can I can honestly advise other women and say it's okay, you know that you love what you do, and 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 that you have to balance your family in an appropriate way or what have you, um, so that you can get to do what you love to do and you can also be with those whom you love, and so uh, people would think that on a show like Seal Team about Navy Seals. Um, that there would be no placement for that. 
but we are an action, we are an, a character driven drama masquerading as an action drama. And so there was a place for that. And I'm very thankful to the writer's room and the executive producers and um, um, my showrunner for allowing that to, to, um, to have a place. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful story. Thank you. All right. Other folks, a story that you brought from your past career or a character into your current business. Um, the, so the show that I sold to ABC is based on DC bar culture and it's based on like amalgamation of like it's a fictional bar that is like a mashup of a bunch of bars that are popular like a, in DC and I've populated it with very DC archetypes um, and and character there and they're based on people that I know and spend time with and we're having conversations that like DC has politics infuses everything so even your bar chatter is you know so it's like a different way into politics but it's definitely based on like what I where I've hung out and my friends and what we've talked about so that's a, a most current example that's beautiful very cool very cool and not a show we've heard of yet so there you go a world that people like to explore yay yay uh, um, oh go ahead uh, I, I, I wanted to highlight, you know, the idea of writing what you know, and then what um, Rashawn was talking about with writing um, um, for her show, in that when I sat down to write that script in 2012, I was like, well, what do you really know? And I was like, what you really know is about like how to get in trouble. And <laughs> I was kind of a mess at that time in my life. And I was like, well, write about the mess because the things that I think are normal in life or normal things to do to other people, I realized like people would be like, you did what? You were where? That's insane. So I was like, okay, you know, like maybe I should write about that, which is what turned into that 30 minute um, comedy that became my calling card. But what's interesting is when I came to, when I got my first meetings in Hollywood, um, the, the manager was like sending me on, on a lot of comedy shows, which I love comedy, but I was like, I have to be honest with you. What I really watch on television is Walking Dead. What I really love to look at is murder. I love blood. I love uh, zombies, anything with an apocalypse. If it's the end of time and people are coming back to life, I am your girl. Like <laughs> right now I'm all about the stand. That is my life. Um, and it was when the original series in the in the book came out as well. So I was like, I know it's gonna be hard to for my calling card to be a 30 minute comedy about black girls running the streets of Atlanta. I don't know how you're gonna get me on Walking Dead, but that's what my dream is. And sure enough, I my first job was Daybreak, a teen um, apocalyptic narrative with zombie type characters. Um, my second job was with a George R. R. Martin show that, that didn't make it on Hulu, but it was about aliens who like attacked Earth. Uh, and now my third job is my actual dream universe, the Walking Dead universe. But it's because of what, um, I keep wanting to say Rashawn. It's Rashawn, right? It's because of what Rashawn said in this, which is why I love apocalyptic, the apocalyptic universe, what you really have are these really small stories that are human stories of people trying to survive. Um, my final comment on that, and I, I know I'm not even answering the question at this point. My final comment on that is um, if there are any like horror, people who love horror, people who, who love what could be considered genre or fringe works is, when I, when I watched um, Walking Dead for the first time, the first time I encountered Michonne and we went into her personal life where she's like the sister with locks, she has a beautiful husband, a little brown baby running around. I was like, who is writing this? Who wrote this? It has to be a sister. This smells like shea butter. What's happening? And then I realized they, had, they didn't have any black women writers. They didn't have any black writers. I think I'm the first black woman writer on Fear the Walking Dead. Um, so all of these shows also have women characters, black women characters. And I think it's important for us to bring parts of ourselves into these stories. So when people who love to look at that world, who love to look at grays can look at it and see the, the sentimentalities of themselves shine through those characters in a way that is very direct where you like, a black woman wrote this, I know it. Um, so yeah. That's beautiful, beautiful. 
Zoanne? Again, mine is very direct. Um, obviously, I've had patients that are patients <laughs> on the show. Um, I worked I worked in the ER up until like season seven. Um, less and less and less. Like I was like four days a week and then four days a month and then like two days a month and then like once a month. <laughs> You know, um, it, it got less and less and less as I realized, okay, maybe I can, I told you I'm not a starving artist kind of person. Um, so, uh, so yeah, like directly patient experiences have been transferred to patients, but I would say that every character on Grey's Anatomy has a little bit of Zoanne in it, uh, in them. Um, we contribute all of our life experiences. I mean, a writer's room in case you, in case you guys don't know is just full of just Blech. just your whole life experience just out on the table if you're if you're kind of afraid of that a writer's room is not really the best place for you um you need to just be able to just like when i was 15 i did this stupid thing um and it it may not make it to the show but it'll generate ideas and it'll generate talk and then you know one thing leads to another and definitely as akila was saying every pilot that i've written for development has some character from my life that is the character. And oftentimes it's me or an amalgam of uh, a bunch of my family or like there's always, always, always experiences there. And then I don't know if any of you are Grace fans, but this past episode, um, the fifth episode of the season, which was about Chandra's mom was literally about my mom, except she didn't actually die. Um, but there was a there was a scene between Bailey and Maggie, which was the entirety of Act Five, and it was one scene with two late two black women sitting on a bench, um, who were professionals, and we talked about um, you know moms and growing up black and smart and women in America, and it was literally it, it became an act because. I did kind of a stream of consciousness writing where I just kind of wrote the whole thing. Um, and I did not want it to be divided up. <laughs> and I convinced our showrunner to just like let it play as, as like a play. And, you know, with COVID and everything, it's having a two person scene outside um, with not a lot of interaction is actually really, really good for the times. So it ended up being just that, just that act. And if you look at my stream of consciousness and you look at the final product, only a few words have been changed. Like it's literally my experience going through COVID with my mom um, who has Alzheimer's. So uh, there's umpteenth number of, of <laughs> examples I could give you of the show being reflective of my experiences in life and all of the writers, obviously. I wanted to, to add my, if you go back and find Daybreak on Netflix, my episode was episode three. And in the episode, the protagonist beats the crap out of her bully with a lunch tray. That's literally from my life. <laughs> my high school bully um, would just pick on me in the lunchroom. And one day I got riled up on runts. I ate like a whole pack of runts and I was like, today's the day. And I beat the crap out of that girl with a, I jumped across the tray. <laughs> just whack, whack, whack. Um, so that made it into the script. And, and this is again, just talk in the, the writer's room. And another thing I bought up was what it was like to be pinned, you know, to become a member of my sorority when I was, you know, it's like 19. So I was like, oh my God. Um, so that also made it into the script, like that feeling of being humbled. Um, but yeah, the, all those little moments from your life, they do end up off times or they, they launch a discussion into something else to become a part of the final product, which is so cool about writing for film and television and that you get to watch the episode and you remember the things that happened in the room that sparked the idea of what's now alive on television. That's so wonderful. And now everyone has to watch that Grey's episode if they haven't seen it yet, because that's a fascinating ability. And that show, and, and, and other Shonda Rhimes shows have done that. I remember Scandal would run a whole act that was just someone having a conversation. And if you care about the characters enough, you don't not waiting for changing the scene. You want to be in. You want to hear what they're saying. So that's really beautiful. It's a beautiful I was story. amazed at how fast that that went. Like we had to cut back a lot of it because I mean, just yeah, I was amazed that it that it worked. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, 
All right, here's a kind of a maybe a silly question, but is there anything you miss from your previous career? A thing that is nothing that you use these days, but was a cool skill or a cool thing that you used to do? Save lives. Saving lives. I only say fake lives now. <laughs> <laughs> a corporate I card. <laughs> Um, I, I think I miss being around young people every day, you know, also being a professor, you're, you're alone a lot, aside from when you walk into that classroom. So I miss having that kind of autonomy. Um, and while I love being in the room, sometimes it can get a little, you know, by week 20, you're like, hey, y'all, let's call this whole thing off. Um, <laughs> no show. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I miss that. I also miss, you know, I don't know if other people know this, but there, there's not a lot of job security in film and television. I'm lucky enough to have a husband who has a really good job. Um, but there are times where you're just like, I really hope we, I, one, I hope we get picked back up. And two, I hope I get picked back mm -hmm. up. So it's like all these layers. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, sometimes you're like, I don't give a damn if this gets picked back up. And also, I don't really want to get picked back up, which is why you should have saved money. Um, so <laughs> anywho, uh, but yeah, I, I miss I miss some of the job security. I miss being around students and young people. They are wonderful. Uh, and I miss my my alone time. Every time I pick up um, the newspaper or I look online, um, when it comes to certain international issues or when it comes to certain domestic issues, I always um, fall back into a frame of mind and I always feel like I can be there and make a difference. And, and that sucks. That really does. <laughs> well, but I want to build on that because I think it's really useful to say now and it leads into one of my questions, which always is for writers. I like to know what you think are the themes of your body of work? What are the messages that you are proud to be putting out in the world? And in a way, yes, of course, we're not going to save lives in the way that, you know, a doctor actually does that. But, you know, what are the themes that you're hoping to put out there that help young people and whoever the viewers are have better things happen in their life or deal with the issues they're dealing with? What, what do you see that in your work? I like the fact that I'm able to be a writer who can present women in, in all uh, of, of our different um, um, facets of life and, and how, we, um, how we are as people. You know, we are not all the same every day. Um, our jobs reflect on us a lot. Our families reflect on us a lot. And I like to be able to write characters, men and women, women and men, um, that um, reflect that, especially in the um, um, space that I used to come, that I used to work in, because it's a hard space to be in. It's, it's, it's hard when you have to get on a plane and leave your family. It's hard when you know that that, that which you are doing makes the um, pardon me, can make the pardon me, that it literally um, makes a difference in how the United States is reflected in the world or how we maneuver with um, our allies and our enemies or or how we protect people, property, here in the United States, citizens, non-citizens, everybody, how we are able to protect them. And so for me, when I see certain things happen, I just like, ooh, I, I, some days I'm not gonna tell you any lies. Some days I'm just like, maybe I should go back. Because when you have a certain skill set and you've been trained in a certain way, or you've been in a specific position where you've been able to train people, you feel like I can go back and make a difference. And, and for me, I'm like, I have to remind myself that's not my world anymore. And there was a specific reason why I left that world. I love that world. But um, it was, it, it had gotten to a point for me well, it, where it was not fulfilling, fulfill, uh, fulfilling because of the fact that um, I was done there. I had contributed as much as I could and, and it was time for me to move on. And as a, as, as a, as a, as a woman who, um, had to literally make that decision and leave all of that behind, you know, I, 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 I have to respect that. 
because it was not easy for me to do that. So when I talk to my friends in DC, you know, I'm just like, hey, y'all, I try not to talk about certain things because then I want to get involved. So I just say, hey, y'all. And, and I think back to um, sitting on a couch with um, my daughters and one specifically being a writer herself, us watching ER and like watching episodes over and over again, specifically Chris Shulak, the episodes that he had directed. And then for me to come to Hollywood and be a writer on a show in which he's an executive producer. I'm like literally living the dream. So beautiful, beautiful, exactly. Strong women is a theme that we love in our program and I personally love. So that's definitely a thing to put out in the world. And we all know that those stories aren't enough there. What else do you guys think are the themes, the messages that you have in your work? Joanne, did you oh, want to go? Sure. I, I personally am very, very, very into entertainment education. I also, I, I have a master's in public health, which I don't know if I said before. And, you know, my, my concentration there was in behavioral sciences or behavioral, uh, my kids are about to interrupt us. Can can you go? No, can I? No, can you water? go? Can I yes, bye. When you're done. Bye. When you're done. Bye. Yeah. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. We're all, it's beautiful to see three dimensional lives. Don't worry about it. Bye bye. Close the door. Um, sorry. <laughs> I can't, I should have warned you that that was going to happen. <laughs> okay, so. Entertainment education is kind of my my whole um, validation for what I do. Because on the one hand, like I said, like I, I don't physically save lives anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm just watching the chat <laughs> go crazy. Um, I don't physically save lives anymore, but I reach so many people through this venue. Like what I what I always say is that in the ER. I have, um, I could tell one person about diabetes and they could tell two friends like that commercial, they tell two friends, they tell two friends. So maybe 20 people know after like a month or so. But I, I do a diabetes story and 20 million people around the world know about it. They've heard about it. They can ask about it. They can follow up with their doctors. Um, we actually have had a lot of um, letters saying, you know, because of the show, I, I got this diagnosis and it basically saved my life. Like one was with metastatic breast cancer, um, you know, that she had been told was probably just a rash. So she, after she saw our, our show on it, she went back to her doctor and demanded, no, I really need to take a better look at this. Got it early and is now, you know, and that's just one of a, a lot of bizarre examples, you know, cause we have a lot of bizarre uh, medical cases on our in our show, but sometimes those are the things that really speak to people. And sometimes it's just the everyday stuff like diabetes that speaks to people like, oh, I guess I need to go get that checked. Look what happened to that guy. He got his foot cut off. Um, so this literally um, just fills me with joy that I still get to do what I trained for without being sued for it or being afraid to get sued for it because the way American medicine works is that everything is so litigious or litigious, I guess is the word, um, that uh, it, it's, it's hard to really practice. And, and it's also, there's, there's so much robbing Peter to pay Paul in medicine and you, you can't do what you want to do. Like I enjoy doing volunteer stuff internationally, but then that's not sustainable unless I want to just stay there and start a clinic. So this way I have a sustainable way of educating people and getting people, I'm sorry, I'm on my my uh, <laughs> soapbox here because this is that is what I absolutely love and what keeps me going and validates my entire existence it's like everything that I did by accident leading up to this led to where I am now like all the little thing pieces came together and brought it to this head so done <laughs> no that's beautiful thank you that's exactly what we're that's a beautiful beautiful sentiment tv is the giantest podium in the world right so make use of it Akila or Kalea? Uh, I tend to write about uh, one, alternative families. So I, I don't, I'm not married, I don't have kids. So I always write about a friend group or a workplace or a bar situation. And, and it's interesting because these are people who have chosen each other. And so like, what is that bond and why are they friends? And why do they, why are they together? And what ties them together? Uh, which I think is often 
sometimes it's it's a more personal bond than like, you know, you you get your your family so your family is, you know. These are people like, why are you still friends through these obstacles and these challenges? I think that's an interesting uh, area to mine. And then also I enjoy characters who are ambitious and driven and dreamers and are chasing a second act uh, like myself. Um, and so, and kind of what that does to your identity when you're starting over, when you're not good at something, when you've been rejected and kind of how do you handle your identity uh, when you're trying to be someone new who you haven't been before. That's beautiful. That totally speaks to the theme of tonight. Thank you. Kalea, uh, what do you think? Uh, I'll say that off of what uh, some of the other speakers have said, um, I, I do feel like film and television subconsciously or consciously is, is a, a tool of education. Someone said the word didactic uh, in the chat. Um, I grew up on like John Hughes and you know the, the For Keeps and uh, 16 Candles and those became the narratives by which I wanted to model my femininity by. I wanted to model my femininity by Claire Huxtable because I thought that that was how, if I was going to be a good Black woman, that's how I had to be. Um, and so what I enjoy writing are complex and capable women and girl characters specifically of color who are in trouble or troubled and trying to find their way. Uh, because I feel like we have to provide those examples. I feel like many of the narratives that some of us were sold when we were younger uh, were damaging and continue to be damaging to us. And we almost had to shed those skin. Like when I was, when I met my husband, my expectations and all these thoughts I had, you know, you Disney. have to shed. I'm sorry? Disney. Disney, right? So you have to shed this, this princess notion, all these things. Um, in order to actually achieve the equity that you desire, right? And so I enjoy writing these characters because I imagine a world where women and girls, specifically girls, are watching and saying, that's me, right? That looks like me. My mom was addicted to drugs, but she got up and she went to work every day. She was very proud um, of her children. Um, and she was a strong woman, right? So when, I, well, I don't wanna to go too deep into it, but there are some characterizations like Moonlight, Moonlight where I'm just like, do we have to do the system like that? But uh, anyway, so what I mean to say here is yes, I do feel that uh, the, the characters that I create are both entertaining, but also edu educational specific, specifically for women and girls of color. Perfect. That's, a, again, a lovely goal of all of us and all of our programs. Okay, well, now another question people always seem to have, especially speaking toward getting more stories out and more stories that are diverse. What is the makeup of the writers rooms that you are in right now, right? What is the, and how do they work together? How do you feel about that? And when you, let's say, start your own writers room someday, what are you going to be looking for? Um, I, uh, so I write for a Black Lady Sketch Show, which is all Black women. Uh, and I feel great about that, uh, <laughs> especially because it is a Black Lady Sketch Show. And then I'm on Black Monday, and the two showrunners are white men who have created a very diverse staff. So there are three Black writers, one Indian writer, and four white writers, and half the room is women, and the assistant, one is Black, the other one is a white woman. So yeah, so they, I, I feel like they've done a really good job. And also Don Cheadle and Regina Hall are like number one and number two on our call sheet. So it's important that the room be diverse because our cast is, is diverse. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm happy with both shows. Yay, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, our room is made up of, um, we have three PLCs, uh, two female um, co-executive producers, and um, about, I know my count is off, but about uh, six men or so in the, in the writing room, writer's room. And um, we have consultants who aren't who are military consultants, so I'm not the only um, veteran in the room. Um, but previous to that, um, we had, okay, so I'm going to say this, and maybe um, these ladies are listening, but we got some badass ladies 
in the room. Um, we last year we had a um, co-executive producer and she had a lot of knowledge and the way she worked that room and she worked her episodes she didn't let anybody put a stamp on it before she put her stamp on it and we currently have two women and um, co-executive producers who do the same thing so I'm very proud to be in the room and watch those ladies work every single day because it is an action drama and um, you would think that it's just about men, 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 and the men's voice and all this, but no, it's it's really a great show in the sense of we respect, you know, the the females not only um, in the writer's room but on the screen, and that's huge. So as that's a veteran, huge. I'm very proud of that, and as a writer, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, I am in genre. Uh, <laughs> A world still to be discovered uh, by Black women. Um, we, we, you know, I, I'm kind of used to being the only Black girl in the room. And if there's a brother, I'm like, whoa, that's, you know, welcome. Um, that's always very interesting. <laughs> um, but I, I will say, though, while I'm usually the only Black woman, uh, most of the rooms I've been in have been very diverse. Uh, Daybreak season two. Uh, the showrunner is a white male, but we were all women in the room, including one trans woman. Um, so I thought that was that was awesome. We had, we had a great time. Um, we didn't get picked up, but we had a great time. Um, uh, Fear right now is is also pretty diverse. Our, our co -P, co EP on the show um, is an Indian British woman, um, so it's great to see her work um, and kind of uh, lead the room. And yeah, so while I, I, I would love to be in a room with other uh, Black women, Akila, that just sounds like Spellman to me. <laughs> that sounds so, so delicious. Um, I, I have been in diverse settings and I, and I feel like specifically in genre, it is still diversifying everybody. If there are any uh, writers of color who are interested in genre, we are wide open. So um, please come. I was sitting here trying to go through the writers and <laughs> and uh, it looks like we have about seven ladies and about four men, something like that. We almost always have more ladies than men. As a matter of fact, when I first um, started on the show, I think there were three guys and eight women and I was and one of them was a, a married writing team. And I was very upset that I wasn't going to be able to find my husband there. And I, that was very true. Um, <laughs> and we've always had more women, um, as we have for the first, well, that's the first time, but we have another black woman writer in the room. I mean, obviously there's always Shonda who looms eternal. Um, but usually I'm the, I'm not the only one in the room. We, we have had a series of black women that have come in and out. Um, we have an Afro Latina, Latino man, um, and one Asian female writer who's actually a, a career changer. Um, she, I think, changed careers from politics when she was in her 40s. Um, and to answer all these age questions, she actually did a couple of programs. Um, I think maybe one was the CBS one and one was the, there's an, there an Asian program specifically. I can't remember the, the organization. Um, but most of our writers are older because we kind of appreciate that, well, a, because we've been on 17 years. <laughs> People like me have obviously are 17 years older. Um, but, but also because we just appreciate that and often we'll, we'll advance the assistance, but even our, a lot of our assistants are career changers, sort of. Um, one of our newest staff writers was a journalist before she came on. Then she went to USC to get her MFA, came on as an assistant, did she was researcher for a year and then she she progressed and and uh there was actually another black woman who came on um who was shonda's assistant after being in the military for a little while and she progressed to being a writer on the show so we do advance our assistants but even our some of our assistants are are older that's beautiful thank you thank you um, gosh, there's so many other questions and there's only five minutes left. So I guess kind of a fun one might be, 
when you go outside of your background experience and do something else, and really Aquila's kind of doing this for the comedy, although politics does lead itself to satire and sarcasm. Um, I don't know, what would be another world you'd like to be on a show that explores? Like, would you like to do a law show or a police show or what a teenage show? What else would you like to explore when you get done on the show that is about what you used to do? I, I always say that if I were to go to a, for a third career, it would be in tech because tech just seems interesting. It's a fun social scene with some real villains and quirky people and a lot of money, which I feel like there's all kind of tension and drama and chaos and conflict when there's lots of money flowing around. And I also think on the flip side, tech does a lot of good for the world. And so the balance between good and evil, I think that's a fun world that I would like to play in after I get through telling all my law and DC stories and my political stories. Anybody? Well, my first degree is in history. And so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge history fanatic, which probably is freaking out my agents right now because every, every sample I have is like an action drama set in 1942. <laughs> For me, I'm always interested in, in, in how the past reflects on the present and the spaces in between. So anything dealing with history, I'm like, I don't care what it is. I don't care whether or not it's in 1011 in Ireland or whether or not it's in, in uh, 1952 Michigan, you know, uh, in, a, in a Black community. So that's what I like to write. That's probably what I'll go to after this. Cool. I always say my next move is to, um, well, this is also coming off of the election and how close it was in America, um, was to move and buy a resort and do real estate and live on the resort and then raise my kids somewhere else. Um, so I feel like that's my next project to write because hopefully I will also be living it and then writing it and then Zooming with people here. <laughs> And you can find me on the resort with Zoanne. <laughs> yeah, writing about parenthood, I think. Doing, doing anything. Um, yeah, I, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. Um, so I haven't necessarily thought, I mean, our my, my plan for the future is in uh, real estate and um, business development. Those are things that I've been interested in on the side. Um, but uh, as far as film and television, I want to, what, which is what I'm learning and doing right now, I want to tell big stories, big budget stories, big narratives, lots of killing, lots of murder. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just being weird. Um, so, so yeah, I'm still learning how to do that. And so that, so that's really what takes up a lot of my time. Um, so I haven't really thought, you know, what's, what's the next frontier just yet. Well, that's beautiful. Well, I have gotten a little note that says, we have run out of time. This has gone so quickly and there's been so much wonderful things said. I've followed the chat, you know, as fast as I could to see and everyone is saying how much they've learned, how thankful they are that you all took the time. Uh, the audience doesn't know, but before we started, there was discussion about several of these ladies were at work in their rooms and had to leave to come to here. And we really appreciate them taking the time. It's been an honor to bring all their stories forward. All we can do is say thank you so much and have a wonderful career. We will watch all your things and keep track of your work. Thank you for being with us. You ladies are amazing. Thank you. So great to talk with all of you. I had a great time. Best wishes to everybody in the chat. That was great. Bye-bye.